So this is about, I think this is my fourth of these videos. What this is, is uh, altitudes, 12 stages of consciousness. This is all 12 of the possible stages that you can be at from any old baby to the enlightened master. That's kind of the spectrum. I've done a, vi a video briefly describing the stages themselves. I did a much longer form series. It's a little bit boring, but it does go into great depth on, on what all these stages look like as far as I know. Some of the higher ones I'm, I'm not very versed in. I also did a video series that covers how someone at each of these stages might talk historically. These do arise both at this time and throughout history, but the most pure versions are, are sort of historical in nature. So you can, you can look at these from a first person or a third person perspective, and you can look at them collectively or individually. Those are what, what we call the quadrants. And I also did a series on what religion and spirituality might look like from each of these stages, because that's a very important point, being that all of these stages do have common patterns of transmitting religion and spirituality, and disambiguating those is key to what we're trying to do here. This is all coming from the, the writing of Ken Wilber, but he's not alone. He's just sort of the figurehead of this integral movement. So the, the goal of this video is to show how I myself have gone through these stages and to paint a very, very, very simple, basic, brief picture of how I manifest each of these 12 stages of consciousness. And this isn't because I like talking about myself. I'm actually a little reticent about that. However, it, it is to encourage you to do this a process of introspection, what it felt like, what it looked like to inhabit each of these 12 stages of consciousness, except of course, including the, the, the final three, which I'm actually not fit to describe. I mean, I'm, I've have dipped my toes in them, but I, I'm not an authority. I'm, I don't really, I'm particularly unfit <laughs> to describe this, but I want to also say never ever trust someone's presentation completely when they're describing the enlightened consciousness state. It's important to realize that there's nodes, there's many important nodes to each of these stages. There's when you first realize it as an epiphany, when you're learning it, and then there's more uh, properly when you're actually embodying it, when you're fairly comfortable in it. And then there's when it's deeply embedded within you and it's coming out. It may be coming out here and there to this day, it probably is. So they don't ever really go away, you just kind of build software on top of them, mental software on top of them. So you have however many of these stages you're really comfortable and influent in, you have them all going at once. I might skip around a little bit in the timeline because I'm just trying to think of really good embodiments of these stages. And I'm not really selecting my first experience and I'm just trying to paint a picture of what each of these stages looks like. Again, as I point out, I did an entire series on kind of the theory behind altitudes and it's very complicated. There's a lot of nuts and bolts. You can follow along, but if you want to get deep into it, I would recommend that series and my also my long play series on the altitudes themselves. You aren't one of these. It's more like there are many aspects of yourself, many multiple intelligences that are waving up and down. You're, you're going into the state and you're coming out of it and you sort of have a center of gravity for each of these independent lines that is, they're all sort of averaging out to one of these memes or one of these stages. These are generalizations. These are almost stereotypes in a way, but they are very true and they are very demonstrable and they're very kind of logically inevitable that this is a, a process of widening awareness and becoming a new self by becoming more complex and stepping outside of yourself and looking at yourself. So what you think is yourself becomes something you can look at, and then, okay, so what am I looking at that thing? That's the new self. It might not look that way from your perspective, but as you do this, as you get up to the second tier, you start to notice this pattern that this is kind of how it's always been. You become able to operate on your own self. And so the new self is one who is self-aware, self-aware of a former self. And this new self is not better. It's not about good and bad. It's more complex and it's more aware it's more self-aware it has more territory to be aware of i would encourage you in the comments if you can if you remember a really specific powerful memorable event where an altitude was very primary or predominant in your life that would be a great discussion to to continue on with this one whether that's first tier or second tier or third tier all three of those could be really interesting if this model is true which i believe it is which is why i'm advocating it and educating people on it spreading it around you should be able to find all of the altitudes up to the one that you're at mostly currently and possibly the next one. 
And once you're there, once we've gotten there, the subsequent ones will probably not make sense to you. And that's very normal. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Just stay open to these ideas. And if you want to question and doubt them, then absolutely, that's you. Do that. Where you're at now the ones above where you're at in terms of complexity and insight and introspection are going to look very fishy and strange, and you're probably not going to like what they have to say, which is it makes total sense. Your, your system is designed to protect you, to keep you as you are in your current shape and form. When, when, you're, when you're prepared to move into a greater complexity and greater self-awareness, you'll experience it with a, a great deal of loss usually and a, and a great deal of excitement so they, both of them that's often what you're protecting yourself from is you're going to have to let go of a former belief system or former solidity that, that's imaginary in nature until you get to the final stage the final couple of stages are letting go of the very self itself to where you are simply consciousness itself of all that is happening this is why there's 12 there it's quite possible for there to be more or to subdivide them more or to, to get more on top but in current reckoning you can't zoom out much more than the non-dual realization because it is simply i am that i am and that's not how an animal or an infant thinks because that i amness is witness to and a party to all of these other stages. So you're a party to rationality. You're a party to postmodern sentiments. You're a party to these integral ideas. You're a, you're a party to the spiritual realizations. If you're at this highest level, you are not filtering. You are not defended from anything. Simply what is, is simply what is. And this becomes quite apparently, quite self-evidently, a religious experience. That's very much how they're described in nearly all traditions. And that's not a coincidence. It's developmental in nature but of course we're talking about stages here and these can occur as states anywhere along this altitude path and that's again getting into the nuts and bolts getting into the theory so without further ado this is altitudes the 12 stages of consciousness from my perspective infrared zero to one years old wow wow i'm a baby <laughs> I literally have no memory of being infrared, as many of us don't, some of us do, but of course, we assume that I was conscious before I have memories, right? The, that babies are conscious, that they're someone in their brain, inside there, looking out through their eyes, maybe not processing things the way that we do, and that would be your infrared, my infrared. Perhaps p part of the reason why we, we can never remember being babies is because it's so different and because it's so... We're not capable of processing everything that's happening or making sense of everything. Perhaps if we could remember being a baby, it simply wouldn't make sense from our present perspective. And, and maybe we do have memories of it, but they just don't look like anything we can, we can remember. We, we do know that those, those early childhood experiences are extremely important to what we become. So it seems that they do remain present with us throughout our life. Note that the inability to form memories is to do with the physical and cognitive limitations of the infant brain, not the nature of infrared. Without civilization, without societal pressure, you could remain infrared your entire life. And so this is where in my long presentation I talk about cavemen and um, feral people, because that, those are, that is what infrared would do if it never proceeded through socialization. Although infrared does not have language or like a structured sense of time and self and identity, an infrared adult should be able to remember people and events. Very much like how instinct works with uh, animals. If, you know, a animals will respond to people and events with, with a certain knowingness. And so that's, that's the infrared sort of knowingness. That's the sort of infrared concept. It's instinctual. It's the same sort of memory that very advanced animals like dogs and horses and pigs exhibit. There is recognition. So the only reason that today we equate infrared with infancy is because our society, our parents, immediately teach babies away from infrared. They immediately bombard them with language and pattern visuals and uh, writing and sounds and, and experiences that are immediately taking us into a collective social space. Away from the animal nature, so you'll stop crapping your pants and knocking glass jars over as soon as possible. Magenta, one to two years. I have a few pseudo memories that I consider my earliest memories because they occur in a house that I only lived at until I was two years old or so. I remember my father setting me on the kitchen counter and asking me what kind of cereal that I would like to eat. 
I wanted rainbow bright cereal. And when we didn't have the cereal, I threw a fit and thought the whole world was over and was just terribly aggrieved because I couldn't have rainbow bright cereal right now. And no amount of crying would make it happen. In this simple momentary fragment of memory, observe two characteristics of magenta. One, my father is the source of reality. I cry to him for what I need. I am upset with him for failing to provide what I need. Sometimes I just scream at the parents not even knowing what I need. It would not occur to me to solve my own problems. I just instinctually place the parents in the position of providing the reality to me. In a magenta society, such as the early agrarian civilizations that we know about and even some existing today, this sort of child-parent relationship continues into adulthood and the family relationship is replaced by a relationship with the earth itself and with society itself into greater and greater levels of comprehension of the spirits of the world and the spirits of the ancestors who then are the providers that make life how it is. But there's no agency at Magenta. The role of the self is to demand and plead and beg with the, the spirits of the world. And so I would redirect that petitionary energy, that begging for reality that would shift to the spirits at best rather than the people around me. For us as children, we, we direct that petitionary energy, that begging of reality into, instead of spirits, we, we direct it at our parents as the providers. So our parents are godlike to us at Magenta. Notice the other mechanic too. I worship this Rainbow Bright character because I like a cartoon that was called Rainbow Bright. It was colorful and dynamic and I assumed that I liked it. So the cartoon is the word, is the cereal. This is magical animism. I, I, it's not that the cereal tastes good, it's that anything Rainbow Bright is Rainbow Bright and that's good. <laughs> so the thing and the representation have a sort of equality with one another that doesn't get sorted out until later. It wasn't the flavor I wanted, it was the brand. So magenta is very, very brand oriented. You worship brands. My mind did not differentiate between the cartoon and the cereal and my personal relationship with the brand. It just knew that it needed Rainbow Bright. That is magical animism. Likewise, I saw the Michael Jackson's Thriller before I ran off screaming, and that was, again, a night terror. That was a horrible brand. That was anything that reminds me of wolves or woods or eyes in the forest or screaming. It, it was all underneath that umbrella. It was a horrible demon. Red, three to six years old. Now... I'm going to talk about when I was nine because the, the, we're getting into stuff that I can actually remember. I, uh, when I was perhaps nine years old, I used to convince some of my friends to go into stores with me and shoplift. I did not originate this behavior. It was taught to me by others. I mostly felt like stealing stuff made me seem cool, like I was Bart Simpson, who was really popular at the time and known for vandalism and <laughs> mildly antisocial behavior. I was terribly afraid of getting caught, and it wasn't that I liked the thrill, nor was it coming from a desire to screw anyone over. I felt slightly guilty about it. It was more like, wouldn't it be fun to go and steal some black and red spray paint than go to a park at night and paint all over everything? Spray paint was really popular in the mindset of the time. There, everyone was skateboarding, and that was part of that culture. These sorts of antisocial pranks, I actually participated in a fair amount, whether it was <laughs> knocking over people's dumpsters or crapping on their lawn, you know, whatever. You know how it is. Kids will be kids. We all get that it's stupid. Vandalism, pranks. You don't think about the risks or the consequences or how it could make somebody feel that isn't a little kid that gets to play around all day. It is pre-rational. It is selfish and without concern for consequences or the feelings of others. I can't deny we've all been there. It made me feel cool because I didn't care about other people. I was like Bart Simpson. I was Beavis and Butthead. These were power gods in that generation. Red meme little boys just want to participate in the game everyone's playing of doing something remarkable, something big. Stunts. They love stunts. You want to be noteworthy in a world of schoolyard legends and local neighborhood lore. For many of us, that was actually our red meme. The horrible monster that lived behind the neighbor's fence that was actually just an animal. The world of play. Video games and sports and screwing around in tree forts and summer camps. Baseball cards. Cards that represent the legendary power heroes of sports. This is all healthy red meme stuff in this current world. But the school system will try to get you past red meme. It imposes structure on you. And if that doesn't work out for you, oftentimes the military or um, the prison system will, will allow you to continue in red meme as an adult or just kind of dodging society and living out your life in a small town or a uh, bad neighborhood. So note the, the hero worship 
And in, in my case, as a little kid, this was all stuff that was on the TV and comic books. And this is probably true today. Um, stars on YouTube, comic book movies. And notice that it, that it is still is rather antisocial. It's not about forming groups yet. It's more interested in the me needs than the us needs. Amber meme, ages 6 to 11. My amber meme period of life, where I was most amber, I would say was a peaceful, homey period of my life. I was in grade school. I loved celebrating holidays. I had a lot of toys and video games and friends and hobbies and junk food. I was kind of a big kid. It was really great. I had a wonderful childhood. My family was my world. My school was part of that world. I was a mama's boy. I explored the neighborhood on my bicycle. I made friends. Those friends were very, very important to me. I always had a sort of chivalrous crush on someone that was always unfulfilled because I didn't actually know what to do when I was in the same room. I'd run away or push them over or whatever. I loved reading uh, fiction novels, science fiction, fantasy, horror. These were sort of the mythos of my time, and it was very celebrated. I would draw pictures of them and write stories about them, create comic books, um, even build little play sets. I really couldn't stand to be alone for any length of time, really. I had to have someone around always, especially if it was dark or I'd start getting weird. I was not afraid of devils and goblins. I was afraid of Freddy Krueger. I knew that movies weren't real, but the mythology is real enough that it scares me. I would generally need to hang out with someone until I was perhaps 12, and even then, I still preferred it. It's so funny to compare with now, where I'm entirely introverted and can't go a long time without being alone. Amber meme, like red meme, you can continue into an adult form um, if you don't ever move beyond it or if you kind of stay mostly rooted in amber meme. It's most prominent in religious systems and the social hierarchy of businesses and strict strict social hierarchies of like business and military are good examples of amber. Orange, 13 to 15 years old. I discovered the orange altitude at a young age as I was exposed to literature and a pretty good education. I came from a liberal family. I remember that at about 12, my friendships became characterized by intense ideological argumentation, and this persisted for several years. It was all about who was more logical. We believed that logic solved every problem, and so we constantly disputed the logic of everything, like Vulcans. There was no concept of perspective or upbringing or that somebody else might know more than you. It was simply a matter of getting to the root logic of the situation wherein we would all be understood. And for some crazy reason, this never happened. We just always argued. For Orange, the world does appear to simply be mechanistic and rational, but there's a lot of unconscious material still. Because Orange is not entirely self-aware or entire, entirely culturally aware, and there's a lot of gaps in the Orange understanding oftentimes. I discovered Ayn Rand in my teens, and if you don't know Ayn Rand, she is a, one of the most best-selling and popular female philosophers of all time, um, very, very deeply in the orange meme territory, um, almost comically so most of the time. I discovered Ayn Rand in my teens, and Rand has always resonated with my soul very deeply, um, at least in the sense that I feel passionately about the sorts of things that she explores and talks about. I find her deliberately hilarious. It is an absolutely 100% orange meme philosophy of life. To this day, I still find it painfully clear that a better world results from more people being orange or higher. I still find it an undeniable achievement to change from believing what your group membership dictates to believing what is proven factual. That is the heart of what Ayn Rand stood for. The orange altitude results in many things that people find both good and bad, such as capitalism, and to a lesser extent colonialism, but it also has resulted in the first world that isn't nightmarish to live in. Regardless of the criticisms you could make of constitutional democracies, you find that people are flooding into them from places that are not constitutional democracies if they are allowed to. The reasons to love first world existence are plain to see. Um, I don't have intestinal worms or syphilis and malaria and also I won't be beaten for being left-handed, but that's because I am the recipient of the benefits of colonialism and my actions are causing damage to the planet Earth's ecosystem. Sure. Green meme, ages 15 to 25. I grew up in a green meme community for the most part, a college town high in ski bunnies and granola hippie earth muffins. Lots of colorful characters, high public IQ. Multiculturalism was a given in my upbringing. However, I started actually expressing green as my own identity sometime in my late teens, 
and it continues right into present day. Green meme is probably my center of gravity, in general, as an adult. It means that if I had the choice between a career that is boring, where I serve some ignoble cause, and doing something that I thought could make a damn bit of difference in the world, I would actually make that choice. I am an existentialist. I do not accept a life without value. I fight against the collapse of value in my life and in the world. When I consider myself an artist, it is always to inspire, to awaken others the sense that there is more to the world, and that the world can make sense and bring fulfillment, and you can get stuck, but you can get out. That's why I spent 20 years insisting that I wanted to front a rock band and write novels and play video games on the internet and make comedy films. It's not because I need to think of myself as an artist or a rock star or something special. Dead honest, anyone who knows me knows that I don't give a shit about that. That what I want, most of all, more than anything else in the world, is to be a meaningful participant in a meaningful dialogue. I want to be someone in the world of ideas. I want to improve people's lives as an artist and as a philosopher. I want to inspire people. When I say things like that, and truly this is the nature of my existence as honestly as I can say, you may say, my god, you're a total narcissist. A total, dissatisfied, beta male, white privileged git who thinks he's so intelligent that he can do everything. Or you might say, wow, you did all that? Cool, good for you. Or you might say, wow, you did all that? My god, I'm sorry. Stages or levels of consciousness. But one thing's for sure, all of those interpretations are to say that I am green meme. My dream is to argue about the nature of my identity and its social construction on the internet. That is terribly, terribly green meme. I refuse to be ashamed of being green meme. Hey, you know why your groceries are killing you? Green meme always has. Green meme actually gets a really bad rap in Integral Theory and Ken Wilber in these circles because of the narcissism and yeah, it's narcissistic. It's a very self-aware, self-educated, educated person. So it has trouble interfacing with others and it, and it tends to know some things so it thinks it knows a lot. It is also very open-minded and accepting. Green meme has always been pro-homosexuals, pro-racial integration, pro-transgender even before anyone who knew who, what that was. Green Meme has always been pro-cross-cultural understanding. It's a benevolent force. Green Meme is largely to blame for our current culture, for the, the social media lives that we now live, and for our social media avatar-based existence. The simulacra is very Green Meme. The 1990s and the aughts saw the revenge of the nerds and the revenge of the Lisa Simpsons of the world, and now Green Meme is sort of in control of things, at least in the civilized world. Green Meme has made a comeback, and that's not surprising, it's more powerful than the other first tier memes. As you go up, they become more powerful. It may be a weak little sissy, but because it's so chill and understanding, it tends to bring everybody together so that they can all agree to get rid of the bullies. Green Meme is getting its self-entitled vengeance, as it does, and I'm a part of that, and I hope you are too. Teal, 26 years to the present. So now we're into the second tier. I'm clearly at the teal altitude, at least in terms of cognition, as I've made the developmental nature of paradigms the center of my life. So clearly, I see the teal structure, cognitively. But given that I'm currently doing this series on the development of consciousness, perhaps my lifestyle is actually beginning to regularly express teal. Or perhaps what I'm doing is a green meme expression of teal awareness. Or a sort of escapism. Turquoise. Since these are going to move out of my current level of consciousness, I will attempt to offer some kind of personal thought or perspective on each of these. The teal awareness creates a sort of responsibility, and when you are regularly fulfilling that responsibility, turquoise will occur. Let's say I'm at teal, and I see a developmental pattern, and I start to say from this habit of, oh, I just really don't care for amber meme. I despise amber meme. They're freaking slavers, dude. They kill you if you think the earth is round. But the teal informs you that you're hung up on something. You're afraid of the public. You're afraid of the mobs and the cults. If you're going to come to terms with things yourself, you're going to have to interact with this. So for you, that would be turquoise. When you've gotten through all of that and all the major general issues that you have arising from prejudice or attachment or assumption, while there's that work to do, if you aren't yet expressing your integral nature in real life, in self, in your society, on the planet Earth, and in all of your relationships, if your authentic self is not plugged into every input that reality offers, then let's consider that your second tier growth process. And I can tell you that I have tons of work to do here, and that has never not been the case. 
And so this is why I wouldn't describe myself, my lifestyle, or my message as turquoise, but rather green and teal, as I'm trying to express levels of consciousness as an artistic outlet for personal growth and community development. Indigo. So again, I'm not into these, we're in the third tier now, and I'm not expressing anything from my history so much. Um, this is what is known as the psychic. This is where the self is beginning to break down, where spiritual experiences become sort of plateaus that you enter from time to time. And I believe that I've spent some time here in the indigo realm. I I'm currently sort of half in, half out. Things to look for, at least in my case. In the indigo, I tend to have very, very, very good dream recall. I tend to be not addicted to anything. I tend to have lucid dreams um, nearly every day, nearly every night. And I tend to have some sort of strange transcendental experience every now and then, like uh, maybe once a month or so. That's kind of how I would describe the indigo world. It, indigo is very interested in spiritual states and will find themselves in very wacky situations, um, aesthetic situations, just find yourself in a strange, just be, just for the hell of it. You may find yourself communing with nature a lot more. A lot of people associate the use of psychedelics with indigo, but I consider psychedelics sort of false indigo. I, I consider that more of a green meme, um, teal meme undertaking, or even uh, oftentimes lower, because with some psychedelics, there are experiences that resemble the indigo world space. I think there is that, that association. And it's certainly not out of the question that a person would include psychedelics in their indigo lifestyle. Violet. It's pretty impossible to describe the subtle from the gross plane where we are now across people. It, the subtle is to be experienced. It, it does no service to talk about it. It makes very little sense. It's mysterious and strange. So this is me filling space, but consider how articulate, how simply brilliant your mind is. Consider how it selects what you think about, how to think about it, when it selects the associations. How in the world do you do that? Totally automatic, right? Unless you're like telling yourself what to think, which is what the superego does, but that's imaginary. But you can't always stop yourself because thinking is, well, automatic or you might say compulsive. You automatically, compulsively, unconsciously select and delete things from your reality. Imagine that you could somehow slow down your mind, slow it down to the point where it freezes, and it just doesn't make a selection. Like say, you look over at the table and you see an apple, and in the ordinary habit of your thought, you would say, oh, I forgot my apple at lunch, I should eat that. But that selection is not made in your mind. You're stuck with the apple. What does the apple mean? Without making the selection, there is you the person, and the story is that you look at the table and an apple, and that is entirely the whole situation, the whole scenario. But nevertheless, it is infinite. What does it mean? How many apples have you eaten? Apples and oranges, green apple flavor, red apple color, Macintosh computers, Johnny Appleseed, New York City, apple bottom jeans. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden are offered sacred fruit by the wicked serpent who offers them knowledge and wisdom. The apple is the first and most sacred of all things. The apple is the sustenance of life, the fruit of knowledge in man's relationship with the world. It is the fruit which bears seeds. What I'm suggesting is that the psyche is infinite in nature and reflection upon an object of awareness can ultimately result in an experience of an archetype. And this is actually the true nature of how the mind works prior to the learned capacity of selection. That the world around you is not spilling out infinitely, it is because you are selecting, and so the unselected parts of your mind are not accessed. But if you can turn off that selection process, you can begin to grasp what the subtle looks like. It's just the mind unfiltered. And so a great way to access the, the subtle plane is deity worship, deity meditation, because we conceptualize the deity as having that archetypal enormity and infinitude, and so it's just very compatible. Ultraviolet. Look at the environment around you. What are you seeing? Is that the objective world? Are those things objectively real? Are they mentally constructed? Are they real in your mind? If you close your eyes, are they still there? Are they still there in the objective world or in your subjective construction of the world? How do you even know they're still there when you're not looking at them? Oh right, because you have a mental construction of reality. Okay, 
So close your eyes one more time in your mental construction of objective reality. Now, where are you? Where are you at? You. Are you in the middle? Where's the awareness? Are you in the corner? Are you at the edge? Are you everywhere all at once? Where do you end and the construction of reality begins? Where does subject become object? I don't mean ideologically, I mean right now, in your present awareness, where do you end? And where does objective reality begin? Uh Uh-oh, you don't mean I am a mental construction? There's a body here that I'm aware of, an environment that I'm aware of, a mind and opinions and emotions I'm aware of, but I'm not located here. I'm imaginary. Reality itself actually does not exist as subjective self and objective world. It is one mental construct being experienced by itself. I don't begin or end somewhere, as we tend to imagine. I have no location. I'm a figment of my own imagination. I should no more believe myself to be that body or the brain within its skull than I should believe I'm anything else around here. Because what I choose to select as me is something I'm imposing on reality, right? I'm imagining that I'm this person because I've been taught that this body has a brain that generates my awareness. And at this point in time, we can say that we know this, and this is undeniably true. But now that the consciousness is here, now that this environment has generated this self-awareness, you see... It's not so simple as to say that I am generated by this brain. This brain has been trained to select. People taught me what I think about how brains generate awareness. I'm civilized. So really, my self-awareness is generated by my society. So I assume myself to be generated by this brain, even though I only think that because people taught it to me and I never came up with it. My brain never would have figured that out. And riddle me this. I sit in a chair and write this. I stand here and say it out loud into a camera. You watch it now and it enters your awareness after it was posted. From start to finish, to greatly simplify the process, I wrote these words into your thinking mind in a conscious, voluntary, participatory process. But to greatly simplify matters, I am thinking thoughts in your mind right now. But I am a puppet of society. Society is thinking you. But society is just a bunch of separate minds, isn't it? Well, is it? I'm asking you, subjective reality, where are you located exactly? Where are you? Scientists can't seem to find you. The only evidence for consciousness is that I am. It is utterly undeniable that I am, But you've gotten confused if you think I am refers to a subject. Subject and object are tools for comprehension. They are a framework. What I am means fully, well, it has to at least mean an intelligent brain, human or otherwise, is generating the sense of a body which has been taught to see itself at some level. And the level that I'm referring to is these levels of consciousness. Like we were saying earlier with the subtle, imagine slowing down until every impression falls out upon the nature of reality itself, which is the nature of the self, the true, authentic self, your original face. Just totally stop everything else and look completely at exactly what you are entirely. Play the chicken and egg game of whether you produce your environment or your environment produces you. And, if it's what you're after, realize that nobody in the world will ever experience your death. Your death is experienced right now as multiple perspectives, and that will always be the case. You are experiencing your death right now. Everyone is. There is no boundary. But this will never be any different. This is the experience of life. You and everyone else is dead. This is the experience of it. Get it all over with. Get it all out of your system. Deal with it. This is also the experience of everlasting life. Clear light. 
Now, clear light refers to the non-dual realization, which is something that, you know, several handfuls of people throughout history have experienced. Hopefully some of you can chime in in the comments, but in general, I try to avoid talking about this one just because it's not going to really do any good. I have a, a little something to say about the, um, the other third tier stages, but for me, non-dual is still just kind of all Greek to me. I don't really understand um, well enough that I could present information that would be meaningful to you. And certainly in my life, I have not had this experience where I'm in a causal state and then it becomes equal to my gross consciousness or I could only kind of parrot what other people say about it and I don't really trust what other people say about it. But yeah, this is the highest stage. It's entering the marketplace with open arms. It's the end of the path. It's integrating the causal experience of enlightenment with all that exists. So I'm going to choose not to make myself appear even dumber by talking more about it. 